even as we wait another minute or so to begin. It's a really good time to explore how we can be a human being with thoughts and be engaged in whatever we're engaged in and maintaining this global sense there is a body, this whole body awareness. So we're basically cultivating a capacity to keep the experience of the whole body in mind, even as we do all the things that we need to do in our life. This is what we mean by embodiment. So we'll begin with the three refuge chant that we've been singing slowly. Feel free to join in. And remember, if you're relatively new to all of this, this uh, chant we do in the Pali language is just a way of remembering that we value Buddha, which means this wakefulness, this capacity to be awake. And we value Dhamma the way it is, what's showing up, what's unfolding, the wildness of our experience. And we value Sangha, this possibility of my engagement, my thoughts, words, actions, arising out of this intimacy of Buddha, knowing Dhamma. So let's do the chant, and then we'll have a guided sit for about 30 minutes. Dang Saranang Kachami Damang Saranang Kachami Sangang Saranang Kachami Dutyampi Budang Saranang Kachami Dutyampi Damang Saranang Kachami Dutyampi <clears throat> Sangam Saranam Kachami Tatyampi Budang Saranam Kachami Tatyampi Damang Saranang Kachami Tatyampi Sangang Saranang Kachami Making any last adjustments. And remembering to recognize there is this body in the most simple, receptive, straightforward way. There is this body 
There is the sitting and breathing body here, here and now, just as it is. And sense how simple and almost effortless it is to keep this experience of the body and mind it doesn't take an intense muscular effort, does it? It's really the effort to be sincerely interested There is this body, the sitting, breathing, sensing body here. And at the beginning of our sit this evening, taking the time to get clear about this receptive quality of mindfulness. So not so much about doing or focusing as it is about remembering, receiving, remembering to recognize what's being received, the sensations of the sitting, breathing body are already here in a sense being known. The heart is naturally and unavoidably sensitive to the physicality of the body. And with this receptive awareness of the body, the sitting body, we're also undoing this habit of thinking that I have to look at or focus on particular sensations in the body. And often that means the painful places in the body. So let's instead cultivate this more general and inclusive whole body awareness. So we're remembering to be sensitive to all the ordinary sensations that are here and now, like the touches of the clothes against our skin. Everything is in a way equally welcomed. The neutral sensations, the unpleasant and the pleasant. Just that sense that they all belong here and now in this experience of knowing the body, mindfulness of the body. And it's this sustained interest 
that begins to build the energy, the momentum of mindfulness. It can become a very powerful force. And to build mindfulness or to build the momentum of mindfulness, we do our best to sustain this receptive present moment awareness of the whole body. And remember, you can use the breath, breathing in, sensing the whole body just as it is, feeling the breath going out, remembering to be aware of the whole body just as it is. And in this way, we can build the momentum one half breath at a time that's doable to sustain whole body awareness for one half breath. That's possible. And then for the next out breath or in breath, that again is possible. And we remember we're not responsible for fixing anything in the body or evaluating or judging. Breathing in, experiencing, opening, receiving the whole body. Breathing out, receiving the sensations of the whole body sitting. So we'll take some silence now and just experiment in a very forgiving way. Experiment with building the momentum by cultivating a continuity, one half breath at a time. So remember to trust this receptive capacity of our heart, the heart's capacity to receive, to know, to recognize it's like this. As you breathe in, recognizing that the body, the whole body is like this. And then the same with each exhalation from the beginning of the in-breath to the end, from the beginning of any out-breath to the end.
So we're noticing the effect of this sustained interest, this receptive sustained interest in the whole body as we breathe in, as we breathe out. And one of the effects is a increased capacity to see clearly with more breath, more depth, more clarity, more sensitivity, which makes it easier to sustain interest, which allows for a greater clarity and comprehension, which builds the sustained interest and on and on. A really beautiful, powerful feedback system between the sustained interest and the clear seeing. And as this energy of samadhi builds, the good experience, the pleasure of the samadhi itself creates the capacity to be with whatever pain, whatever sensations are coming and going. And remembering that the sustained interest, it really isn't tight at all. It's relaxed and receptive, allowing the body and the sensations of the breath simply to show up and be known.
So we're keeping it simple. Can the mind keep the body in mind? Keep remembering there is a body here and now. Breathing in, sensitive to the body just as it is. Breathing out, sensitive to the body just as it is. And for the last few minutes, experimenting with periods of time where there's no wavering, no gaps in the continuity of mindful awareness of the body. Aware the body in and of itself. There is this body, this flow or movement of sensation here and now. And appreciating both the breath and the depth and the continuity of awareness here. Notice the calming and healing effect that arises with some continuity. And you might even notice how when there is some continuity of awareness with the body, quite naturally, the mind experiences more space or freedom with whatever is coming and going in our experience. There's a natural arising of equanimity, dispassion, allowing things to come and go, less sticky, less reactivity. So notice if you can feel, sense any of these fruits from the continuity of wisdom and awareness.
And now, even as we adjust, see if you can maintain that global sense there is a body, even as you move or stretch or take a sip of water, stand for a moment, whatever is helpful. And before I forget, I'll paste the uh, link for anybody who is interested in supporting the center and teacher. And of course, you can always support Common Ground and support myself and uh, Shelley Graff, the two staff teachers, by donating at any time through the Common Ground website, of course. And just contact the center if you have any questions about how all that works at the center, this circle of giving and receiving. And maybe later in the course, somebody who's been around for a while might want to give a little five minute reflection on Donna or this uh, practice of generosity that we use at the center. If you're interested in doing that, if you've been around for a while and would like to share with the whole group uh, near the end of the course, just send me an email and we'll find a time that works. Um, it's nice to hear different voices talk about how that all works in a person's life. So we're getting right into the middle of our eight week class on mindfulness of the body. And it's really part of four courses. So this whole year, we're gonna be moving through the Buddha's teachings on the four foundations of mindfulness. Of course, the winter we're looking at the Buddhist teachings on mindfulness of the body. But it's really uh, a time for us, especially with this first foundation, mindfulness of the body, it's really a time for us to get clearer about what mindfulness is and what it isn't. Because there's all kinds of habits that we probably have picked up, um, including Mindfulness is focusing our attention on something. That's not mindfulness. That's focusing our attention on something. Mindfulness is really related, as um, people have heard me talk about, I think even in this class already, but just this capacity we have to remember the present moment, to remember, to recognize, oh, this is being known. <clears throat> And mindfulness of the body in particular, as um, we've been talking about these last few weeks, the Buddha strongly, strongly encouraged us. Everyone's still here, sorry about that. I'm using my hotspot for my phone and hopefully that will be adequate. Can you hear me okay? Great. Yeah, so... Um, we were just talking about how mindfulness of the body is strongly, has been strongly encouraged by the Buddha as sort of a foundational practice. And uh, we'll be using, and you might've seen the email I sent out earlier this afternoon. And I had the link for um, Bhikkhu Analio's book. Um, here it is, Satipatthana Meditation, a practice guide. And it's his third book on the foundations of mindfulness. It will be a really excellent refer reference text for all the courses, the Buddhist studies courses this year, because it has you know, chapters on the body, on feeling tone, which we'll do in the spring, mindfulness of the mind in the summer, mindfulness of dhammas in the fall. But, um, um, you know, Venerable Analio, he likes to talk about mindfulness of the body as the hub of the wheel of our whole path, the whole path of awakening. Because the hardest thing, as you might be, have heard me say, uh, this quote I love from Thich Nhat Hanh, the only real enemy is forgetfulness. And so uh, we need to find a way to remember what do we want to remember we want to remember the present moment we want to remember to recognize or connect and sustain with present moment experience as opposed to being lost in thought 
And one of the great discoveries, it's so ordinary and simple, but one of the great discoveries is what a useful um, gateway in a way the body is to the present moment. And even this simple phrase, and, and Venerable Analio, this German monk who wrote the book, he really recommends this phrase, there is a body, or there is this body. So just experiment with that this week, and even tonight as you're listening to me, and we'll have some time for questions before we're done at nine tonight. So even during the Q&A time and the time of listening to me, just insert that in a very gentle, loving, non-forceful way, that, that verbalizing, right? There's really room for concepts, for skillful thoughts and practice. And that, that simple thought, oh, there is a body. <laughs> there is a sitting, breathing body. It feels like this. As a, and then just notice cause and effect. Notice how your experience as a human being shifts when there's that moment of recognizing, remembering to recognize there is a body. There is a breathing, sitting body. There is this flow, movement of sensation here. And, and in, immediately when we remember there is this body, to some degree, depending on how um, balanced and how much momentum there is to the awareness, we'll recognize how the mind is in relationship to the body, how the mind is knowing. So not only will we know the body as a flow of sensation, but we'll also, maybe surprising initially, but over the course of your practice, it will make a lot of sense we also get to know the mind. This mindfulness of the body really helps us to get to know the mind because what is it that knows the body? There's no body without the mind that's knowing it, right? And so first, you know, we notice obvious sensations, the body's cold, the shoulder aches, and then we learn by practicing not for the attention, not to get transfixed on that one predominant experience in the body. Often, not always, but often it's the painful place or places in the body. And then because of the habit, the habits of our way of paying attention, we tend to get fixed on that. And we tend to proliferate, to think why does my shoulder hurt so much? And there's that sort of dynamic between a moment of feeling the painful sensation, many moments of thinking, thinking leading to more thinking, a brief moment of noticing that the pain in the shoulder is still there, more thinking, more proliferating, and on and on. And it can fill up the space of a whole life, really. You know, one little drama after another so that's why we're having this more generalized whole body awareness. Basically, we're breaking habits where we're only interested in what's most intense, intensely pleasurable, but more often intensely unpleasurable. And everything else, what do we do? We ignore it. So we want to break those habits. That's why the Buddha is recommending this whole body awareness, this inclusive, generalized exposure, sensitivity, sustained, and even joyful interest in body. And it's not our habit. So we build that habit by willing, a willingness to start over and over and over and over. And really notice there's something... Um, the image that's used, you know, remember that clay, I don't know, I'm <clears throat> 62. And when I was <clears throat> in elementary school, we had that really stiff clay. Do you remember that it came in sort of long rectangle or rectangular shapes? And you had to really work it before it sort of got warmed up and you could actually do something. And, you know, living in Minnesota, <laughs> you know, the, I don't know, 
inside of our buildings were a little colder, but it seemed like it wasn't almost worth it, <laughs> you know, with your little kid hands to try to warm it up so you could actually shape something with the clay. And it's a little bit, this is a nice image for our minds because our mind is kind of stiff when we get started. It's not pliable, it's not malleable, it isn't nimble, it doesn't have a lot of power, right? Because it's hasn't that, it hasn't been warmed up basically, that momentum of mindful awareness, or you could even say the momentum of wisdom and awareness. But when we do get some momentum, we'll all be impressed by what a mind that it has some momentum of wisdom and awareness, what it can see, what it can understand, what it can do. You know how it is when we're really dead to the world, wake up in the morning and still feeling a little intoxicated by the dreams we were just in the middle of, you know, and lacking caffeine and, and our minds really, if someone gave us a, a problem to solve, we, we wouldn't be very good. But there are other times when the mind, you know, is really imbalanced and, and really can see clearly and not get thrown off. And that's the kind of mind we'd like, especially when we're in dangerous territory of saying something stupid to someone that we'll regret. We want that mind that's really nimble and pliable and can basically do what needs to be done, not too much, not too little, not feeling overly needy so that I sort of distort the situation to have my needs met, not overly anxious or overly irritated and wanting revenge. So in a way, the whole body awareness, this sort of general whole body, sustained, kind interest in the body, it's a place where we, we learn how to build that momentum of mindfulness and samadhi, wisdom awareness. And you'll, you'll really get a sense of what it is and what it isn't. Like when we over tranquilize, we're using the body and the breath, but we're kind of suppressing the mind because it's been getting us in trouble, right? Always worrying, planning or whatever. So we're sort of beating it down with the meditation object, the whole body awareness. And what we'll feel is like we're drugged. You know, we might be relatively calm or relatively peaceful, but there's no brightness, there's no clarity, there's no capacity to comprehend the nature of things. And other times the mind will be really hypervigilant, really bright, but no groundedness, no settledness, no tranquility. So when you work with mindfulness of the body, throughout the day, and then at the beginning of your sitting periods, really see it as a, a very um, functional and like a real gift, because it's such a good place for me to develop some momentum of wisdom and awareness. And I can get a clear sense of when, I, when it's there in the mind, in the heart, and when it's not there. And it's really important that we develop that sense of samadhi. And one of the reasons we covered pain last week, and we'll spend a little bit of time tonight going back to uh, talking about pain, and you might have questions. I'll try to save 15 or 20 minutes at the end tonight for questions about pain and about mindfulness of the body generally. Because... It's always a little bit like a chicken and egg problem. Like, how am I going to have this sustained interest, this receptive, this wise and kind interest presence with the body? Because we feel very strongly that first, I need to get rid of this pain in my body, and then I can be mindful, right? And uh, I remember Joseph Goldstein, one of my teachers, saying, don't believe that thought. <laughs> that thought being like, I got to get rid of this first, and then I can really do the practice. That's called delusion. So we need to, 
and this it's chicken and egg in the sense that we always feel like uh, I can't do it until I have the perfect conditions to do it. But we never have the perfect conditions to do it. So we generally give up. I mean, that's unfortunately the truth. And even those of us who've been doing it for a long time, when we're really honest, you know, sometimes we're just going through the motions. Sometimes we're just suppressing the mind, like I mentioned earlier, using some meditation object or some meditation technique just to suppress things, to get a little break. Sometimes we're just fantasizing. Sometimes we're fantasizing about Dharma practice. <laughs> so there we are on a retreat or in our morning sit, and we're mentally proliferating about meditation. But we're not meditating, we're thinking about it, imagining it, thinking about being good at it, thinking about being bad at it. There's any, maybe an infinite number of ways to avoid Dharma practice. <laughs> <laughs> so much of the path is recognizing these patterns of avoidance. And that's why we often talk about the whole path as going against the stream. Because the mind's habits are mostly around distractedness and attainment, like trying to get something, trying to fix something. Not that all that doing of fixing and getting rid of and holding on to is bad. Some of it is going to happen. It's totally okay for it to happen, but it isn't really going to save us in the end, you know, like spending my, most of my mental energy <clears throat> really thinking deeply and working on having the perfect kitchen, the right kind of floor, the right kind of kitchen utensils, the right kind of ingredients so that I can cook the meals that are good for my body. You know, what kind of stovetop, natural gas, but does that pollute the indoor air? Well, maybe I'll get one of those convection ovens that blows the hot air around. You know, it's like we could literally, there's no end to how much thought and conversation and then let alone the shopping and then learning how to use it and and then we die. So we don't, that work of solving problems, we need to use the mind to solve problems, just to earn our living and to maintain our relationships and figure out what we're going to do with our kitchens, and all these things. But we shouldn't lie to ourselves and imagine or tell ourselves that somehow that's going to resolve the issue of life which is suffering and the end of suffering, how to be free, how to be liberated from these cycles of suffering, these seemingly endless cycling of suffering, suffering begetting more suffering. So that we wanna break that cycle and then we've got this sort of place to do that, which is this working ground of mindfulness of body and building the momentum of wisdom and awareness. Can you still hear me? Good. It looked like I was frozen up, but maybe it's just my video. So I want to spend a little bit of time uh, reflecting on pain some more and appreciate Tom sending in an email about uh, hopefully some of you read at least part of Darlene Cohen's article in that book, Being Bodies. And it was, uh, uh, I think the subtitle was something like Buddhist women's writing or reflections on the paradox of embodiment, being bodies. And it came out quite a long time ago, I think at least 20 years ago. And uh, Darlene Cohen, who was one of the abbesses of the San Francisco Zen Center a while back, I think she's passed away, maybe five years ago or something. Um, she had an article in that book, Being Bodies, and that's what I sent out week one. And it was in today's email too, um, at the bottom of the email, if you didn't get a chance to read it. But there's that uh, one phrase that somebody sent in a question about where Darlene wrote, we must penetrate our pain so thoroughly that illness and health 
lose their distinction, allowing us just to live our lives. And I think it's appropriate for that to be a little bit paradoxical. I wanted to read, I don't know if everyone got to the end of uh, the, the chapter that Darlene wrote. Because part of learning to relate to pain is to uh, recognize the mind's reaction to it and make peace. Because it's quite natural when I'm experiencing physical pain or any discomfort, it's quite natural for the mind not to like it. You wanna, we wanna recognize that as a natural arising when there's pain, the pain is gonna trigger the not liking, the aversion and the hate. And then the, the key will be then to look at the hate and the unpleasantness of the ill will and the not liking and the being afraid of the pain to really make space with that, like that can be included. When we recognize that and we recognize the painful sensations, when we have an honest relationship, then it, it just, in a way, it begs the question, well, do I, when I've made peace with the present moment, when I've been able to be receptively aware, mindfully aware, do, is the aversion needed? It's not even so much that we get rid of the aversion, but we include the whole picture the depth of it and the breadth of it. And then quite naturally wisdom understands that aversion doesn't, isn't needed anymore. It falls away naturally without me thinking, you know what, I shouldn't be averse to this pain. Well, the aversion to the pain, you know, it's just as much nature as anything's nature. And it arises because the lack of perspective we're in a particular perspective where pain is bad. And this is one of those really unquestioned assumptions about life. Emotional pain is bad, like the pain of loss. There is the pain of loss. There is emotional pain, just like there's physical pain. But is it truly bad or good? No, it's what it is. Pain is what it is. And this is sort of the insight that we can have. Now, of course, the best place to develop this insight isn't when physical pain is overwhelming. It's when it's mildly irritating, right? A little cold, a little achy, a little cramp in the sole of your foot or something like that, or even a little itch, a little restlessness, a little stiffness in the back where you know you're not going to die and you know you're not going to harm, you're pretty sure at least you're not going to harm your body. So you can hang out, breathing in aware of the whole body and, and, and aware of that pain and really seeing that when I see everything that's there, when I learn to include everything that's there, can, I, can the wisdom recognize pain as pain? You know, there's that adage that gets used a lot in the Buddhist tradition. Suffering is pain plus resistance. So what is pain? What is physical pain, physical discomfort when the mind has ceased its resistance, has ceased perceiving the pain as bad? Doesn't mean it's not aware of the sensation, it just means that it, it's able to see it with a greater breadth and depth as something being known. You know how it is uh, when we get hyper vigilant, hyper aware of discomfort, it's harder to deal <laughs> with any discomfort. So the, the wisdom piece is just realizing 
normalizing the exposure we have in life to pain, emotional pain, physical pain. And, you know, different, different people here in the group, you just have to find your own way to shift. Like hopefully even now with what I'm saying, it will just challenge. We could just on an intellectual level, at least to begin with, just challenge like, well, maybe I don't need to classify pain as bad. And so even that intellectual idea, that concept, pain is just pain. It's neither good nor bad. Then, you know, when next time there's pain, we can, that perception can change where we might have a little bit more space. Is it really bad? What is it? And it's almost like a fresh look. But it means that we're really not afraid of it. And this is what Darlene wrote at the end of the chapter I thought I'd share. Um, it's this, the last two paragraphs. People sometimes ask me where my own healing energy comes from. And she, you know, in this chapter is really talking about serious medical issues over a period of time. How in the midst of this pain, this implacable, slow crippling, can I encourage myself and other people? My answer is that my healing comes from my bitterness itself, my despair, my terror, it comes from the shadow. I dip down into that muck again and again and am flooded with its healing energy. Now, this is really the alchemy of Dharma because when we know we're hurting and that hopefully then activates, okay, this is being known. So we're really seeing the resistance we're seeing the not liking. We're seeing maybe feeling really oppressed by the pain or whatever our emotional experience is in that moment. That's the dipping down into it. Because we don't really open or realize the liberating wisdom. It really needs that exposure because basically we're realizing the heart that's not afraid of being honest about what it's like to be in pain and to be with all the emotional reactivity to pain. So where, what is the heart? What is the understanding that is able to willing to have an intimate and honest relationship when I'm, when the mind is freaking out about some pain? feeling claustrophobic because it's not going away. And we don't realize that wisdom, that love, that liberating understanding, we only realize it when we're right where we don't want to be because it shows up because that's the only thing that can show up and be intimate and relaxed and tenderhearted and patient, right? So you see why the mindfulness of the body is so useful. It's not just the pain, it's also just the really beautiful experiences we have in the body. I took this from one of the early poems of the enlightened nuns and monks, and they were just talking about a different experience of the body. And one of the lines in the poem is, how light my body touched by abundant rapture and bliss, like a cotton tuft born on a breeze. It seems to be floating my body, right? So sometimes it's twisted steel, sometimes it's dead weight, sometimes it's light and flowing and, and really um, beautiful. But the idea is uh, to train the heart and mind to let the body be what it is going to be in this moment. Oh, it's like this now. It's like this now. And we're developing the understanding, the wisdom that knows how to show up to the body, however it is. And that wisdom, that love that can show up to the body, however it is, 
that's liberating. And this, uh, <clears throat> this goes back to, um, you know, what I said right at the beginning of class tonight, that by being intimate with the body, we get to know the mind. And it's really, you know, it's so sort of interesting that this mindfulness immersed in the body, cultivating an embodied awareness, really transforms our relationship to the world, to the body, to sensuality generally. And it's, you know, it's, I guess, a, in a way, it's a real paradox that by training our mind, our heart, to be attentive, sustained interest in the body and the breath and the postures and the bodily activities of reaching and turning and sitting and standing. By doing this training, we get to know the mind. We reveal the heart and mind that can be independent of conditions like the conditions of the body. Because Nibbana, the, what the Buddha came to realize in his own heart, his own mind, what other um, wise teachers and practitioners have realized for themselves, the same insight the Buddha had, it's, it's the heart or mind that is independent of the world, but in the world. <laughs> And like when we wonder, well, how am I going to raise my three kids? Or how am I going to keep working for another five years before I retire? Or how am I going to get along with my partner? Or how am I going to uh, lean in and try to make this world a more just world? When we recognize the complexity and messiness of the world we inhabit, it's, it's precisely this insight that allows us to engage. It's like when we realize that I, the heart is independent, the mind can be independent, then I can really give myself to engagement 100%. Because, I, because in a way, I'm, I'm no longer afraid and I'm no longer dependent on climate, global climate, coming back into balance or racial justice being resolved or income inequities being taken care of. Because there's no fear, no tightness, there's no holding back. There, the engagement is more full, more nimble, more creative and more fierce. It really knows how to show up and take care of the ordinary and the extraordinary in life. But until we realize that, you know, kind of have that gradual awakening where we're really seeing, realizing the mind that can be independent while engaged, not thrown around. And then it starts to make a lot more sense about how, why we use the body, because it helps us cultivate that insight, how to be intimate, how to be clearly aware how to have the breath and the subtlety, the depth of awareness of body. And to note, because when we do have that awareness of the body, of course, every habit of reactivity is going to get triggered. When the body feels light as a tuff of cotton, we're going to really like that experience of the body and want to hold on to it. Like, this is what I want. And so we see that reactivity of greed. And when we have the unrelenting pain in the body, or nausea, or we can't breathe because we have a bad flu, or whatever it might be, and it's triggering whatever it's going to trigger, right? we develop this wisdom that knows how to include, knows how to be intimate, knows how not just not to be afraid of the sensations, but not to be identified or afraid of the reactivity. We learn how to be intimate in the messiness, wildness of our lives. Let me read a little bit more from this uh, um, section from Darlene Cohen's um, chapter in the book. 
So I just ended with that sentence. I dip down into the muck again and again, and I am flooded with its healing energy. This realization of the heart and mind or the realization of the wisdom that's not afraid of the world and the bodily experience being the way that it is. And she writes here, despite the renewal and the vitality it gives me to face my deepest fears, I don't go down willingly when they call. I've been around that wheel a million times. First, I feel the despair, but I deny it for a few days. Then it tugs, its tugs become more insistent in proportion to my resistance. And finally, it overwhelms me and pulls me down, kicking and screaming all the way. It's clear I am caught. So at last, I give up to this reunion with the dark aspects of my adjustment to pain and loss. Immediately, the release begins. First peace, then the flood of vitality and healing energy. I can never just give up to it when, it first, when I first feel it stir. You'd think after a million times with a happy ending, I would give up right away and just say, take me, I'm yours, but I never can. That's why like we're all hearing this, just like I've heard it a million times from my teachers and from the Buddha's writings or recorded teachings, but it doesn't help, does it? We have to, you know, because pain will arise, whether it's emotional pain or physical pain, and it's gonna trigger all those personality patterns of resistance and the very strong conviction that pain is bad. It's not fair, it shouldn't be this way, or why me, poor me, or I'm just gonna pretend it's not here or whatever our strategy might be. Because those patterns, reactive patterns, they're not personal. And because they're not personal, there's no person who can say, don't do that, Mark. We do that, we say that to ourselves, don't do that, because we know it doesn't work, but we do it anyway, because it's not personal. Those impulses to resist pain, to hate pain, to want to blame somebody, they're just part of the, you know, the many causes and conditions that are in play. And so we have to be patient with you know, how we relate, what shows up, and we hang in there and we hang in there and we hang in there because part of what can support the transformation of how the mind relates to pain is seeing that react, the, these patterns of reactivity don't work. How's this working for me? It's not helping, right? It gets so clear that hating the pain is extra, is counterproductive, right? And we see it in ourselves, we see it internally, we see it externally in the world around us and the people around us, and we see that over and over again. And eventually we learn. And sometimes we have to be dragged down like Darlene is talking about here, but sometimes we see the writing on the wall and we call upon that wisdom and love. Oh yeah. And that's why we want to really um, resolve to practice with the very ordinary and mundane discomforts and pains so that we have some momentum, some confidence when we do get really sick or we do experience a lot of pain or we're in the dying process. And you know, which is sometimes very painful, at least as it appears from an outsider, right? So we want, we don't want to wait until we have cancer or until we're dying or until we bang our head on the cupboard. We want to just start working with the ordinary discomforts. One of the reasons why after years of practice, we lengthen the time we sit is we start to feel pretty comfortable sitting. And it, pain is such a powerfully transformative teacher we have to sit longer in order to meet our teacher. So we'll you know, go from sitting for 15 minutes to 30 minutes to 45. When we're on retreat, people sometimes sit for many hours at a time. Still seemingly from the outside, they seem relaxed, but there may be tremendous physical discomfort, but the mind is really working that edge. 
can I be with? I can't be with this for 10 minutes, but can I be with this for one in-breath? Good, then let's just stay here for one in-breath. Can I be here for one more out-breath? Yeah. So really see this as something, um, take advantage of the class and really play with, and I think that's a good word, with the physical discomfort that comes up for you in your sitting practice. And uh, it's like bringing a fresh attitude to it. Okay. First, just acknowledge the habits of how the mind through its habits of perception wants to frame the pain. And just that serene smile, of course, you know, like you're talking to this habit of the mind to perceive pain as bad. Of course, this is how the habit frames pain. Of course, right? What's another way? Well, it's just these intense sensations being known. And then this, this uh, psychological habit of hating it or wanting it to be done or whatever that emotional psychological habit might be. Oh, can there be this breath and depth, this inclusive awareness? What happens when it's all included, all seen as natural, whatever showing up, the pain itself, the sensations itself, and whatever reactivity, whatever habits of perception. When it's seen as nature, then what does that set in motion? Because we need that edge where we're really close, aware of those reactive patterns because it's, it's only deeper wisdom that's able to see all of that, hold all of that, receive all of that without being confused by it. So in a way, these edges, like pain is one of these edges in practice, it really uh, requires wisdom, deeper insight to start manifesting. So in a way, you know, the process of insight, of deepening insight, deepening wisdom, well, it needs to be provoked. And how do we provoke, provoke deeper wisdom? We open to more and more reality. We get interested in reality as opposed to running from it, distracting ourselves, we open. And pain is just one of those places that we can open. And the last uh, couple of sentences here, if you went willingly, it would be called something else like purification or renewal or something hopeful. It's staring defeat and annihilation in the face that's so terrifying. I must resist until it overwhelms me, but I've come to trust it deeply. It's enriched my life, informed my work, and taught me not to fear the dark. So hopefully that can be an inspiration for us just to change our relationship to fear or to pain rather. So in the next uh, three weeks, we're going to be um, digging into the Satipatthana Sutta and we're gonna be doing some uh, three meditations over the next three weeks that are going to help us change how we relate to the body. So next week we'll do a meditation on the body parts because we tend to think of the body from this visual image that we have, but it's much more simple and ordinary, right? There's skin, there's fleshy stuff, and there are bones, hard stuff. And then we'll look at the elements. These are the traditional meditations in the Satipatthana, just the hardness and softness and the temperature. But basically the, what the Satipatthana Sutta gives us is ways to change how we experience the body from kind of being caught in our habits of perceiving in terms of our idea of the body to creating uh, ideas that sort of challenge that and correct distortions. But for this next week, until next Monday, 
I, I just encourage everybody to just work on what we did with the guided meditation tonight. And then to use the instructions I gave that first week. Um, and thank you, Barbara, for your question that came in. Um, this uh, practice of, in, of being aware of the four postures and being aware of the activities of the body. So that during the sitting time, you can sustain that whole body awareness. And then when strong pain arises, then just experiment with turning toward it when you can bring that balanced curiosity to it and see the impulses to react, to not like it and include it and see what ceases when you're holding it with a breath and a depth. And then when there's no strong pain, go back to the whole body awareness. And then sometimes when the pain is really strong, you need to go from looking at the pain to moments of going back to the whole body awareness. Just staring at painful sensations sometimes is not helpful because there's not enough balance. It's only when you feel confident and balanced and actually curious do you want to look at the painful sensations. If you're not feeling balanced and curious about the aversion, for example, then open to the whole body and even go to hearing something even more neutral until you gain confidence in being with your present moment experience in a balanced way. And we're never gonna leave this training, certainly not for this course and probably not for decades, this awareness of whole body. So this is something we're gonna keep, this working ground, this training ground is something we're gonna keep coming back to. So that's the more formal part. But during the day, it's really using the postures and using the activities of the body as a way to come back into the body. So whenever you're reaching, whenever you're sitting down or standing up or moving the body in any way or involved in bodily activities like chewing and swallowing or brushing teeth or using the toilet or whatever it might be, just use the physicality of these bodily activities and bodily postures. And then uh, in Barbara's email, she asks about that last part of those instructions where it uh, goes like this. Um, As one remains thus heedful, ardent and resolute, any memories and resolves related to the household life are abandoned. And with their abandoning, one's mind gathers and settles inwardly, grows unified and centered this is how a practitioner develops mindfulness immersed in the body. So as one remains thus heedful, ardent, and resolute. So that's like, I'm really committed that even as I go about my business during the day, with this general awareness of the body, I can do everything else I need to do. Obviously, it's a little harder when we're in conversation with another person to maintain it, but that's going to be one of those edges. But certainly those times when we're not talking or listening to somebody else talk, we can have that whole body awareness of our activities and postures. We can train in that. And even then working into that edge of when we're talking, like right now you're listening to me. So just exper experiment. Can I continue to be aware there is this sitting body even while listening to Mark talk? Right? Isn't it possible to be in the body, to be aware there is this body, even at the same time the mind is comprehending what I'm saying? It's possible. And it's really useful. So we're heedful, we're ardent, we're resolute, resolute in that, like, this is useful, this is helpful. Any memories and resolves related to the household life are abandoned. So just this is really talking about the shift in allegiance where we think what's important is to get comfort or to get something and to get rid of something that's painful or difficult. In Buddhism, we call that a worldly perspective or um, attachment to sensuality. Thinking that happiness lies 
and having what we want and getting rid of what we don't want. Now there is for sure a kind of happiness that comes from having what we want and getting rid of what we don't want. But if we're honest, we realize that happiness that we get from getting what we want, getting rid of what we don't want, isn't a lasting resonant happiness. It's a restless happiness, always under threat because conditions change, right? So he's saying, what the Buddha is saying here is that when we really cultivate this awareness of the body with postures and bodily activities, something starts to grow in our heart, some wisdom, and we become less entranced with getting pleasure and getting rid of pain. And we're seeking a refuge that's different. We have a different allegiance, the allegiance toward the happiness of non-attachment versus the happiness of getting what we want and getting rid of what we don't want. So if you wanted to invest in happiness, would you invest in happiness where you got what you wanted and didn't have what you didn't want? however tenuous that would be, however vulnerable to change that would be, or would you be interested in the happiness of the heart that's independent, not dependent on having what it wants and not dependent on getting rid of what it doesn't want? A heart that's content with whatever comes and goes. So personally, I'm interested in that happiness of letting go that happiness of non-attachment. I've had enough experience in my practice that I really have grown to trust that deeply. And so we're, we're all just where we are with that switch where the Buddha says, any memories, resolves related to the worldly life, to sensuality or abandon, thinking that sensuality, having what I want, getting rid of what I don't want is gonna take care of me. He's saying that gets abandoned and with their abandoning, one's mind gathers and settles inwardly, grows unified and centered, right? So there is that peace of seclusion. My mind, my heart is at least temporarily secluded, has some space from this incessant hunger to get what I want and get rid of what I don't want. So Barbara was asking, uh, for what that last part of these two instructions refer to with the mindfulness of the postures and the mindfulness of bodily activities. So I've used up all of our time. Maybe there's time for one question. Um, did anybody have a question? Yeah, the full range, right? Like I mentioned some moments because the body isn't one thing, it's a changing process. In some moments it will be twisted steel or wiry electric energy, really fidgety restlessness. And other moments like a cotton tuft, very light, almost like it doesn't exist, feels more like space than something solid and heavy. But the important thing is not to trust our idea or mental image of the body but to learn to trust the direct immediate experiencing of the body, whether it's twisted steel or light as a tuff of cotton. But when we start to open, we want that wisdom, at least on an information level, concept level, that it is in motion. So however it's appearing right now, it's not fixed. So be on the lookout for like, I'm totally screwed because my body's like this. Well, in this moment, it's appearing like this. In this next moment, and if we really have that breath, that, that breath really is recognizing its unfolding nature, that it's in motion. And it can go from being a tuff of cotton, that if I really want that to last, in just a moment, I could be all tied up into knots of wanting that nice feeling of the body to last. And now it's like twisted steel. And then I'll laugh, it's re wisdom recognizes that attachment and it could pop like a bubble and I could be back 
recognizing the body as energy, like you were saying, Sean, light flowing, not fixed at all. So it can go back and forth so fast, especially when there's um, uh, some real momentum at practice. We can go from hell to heaven, to hell, to heaven, to hell. And over time, what's the effect? Dispassion. This body isn't a refuge. We need to be intimate with the body because it's here and now. But I'm, the mind no longer is looking toward the body for a permanent refuge. So we take care of the body. We include the body. We're intimate with the body. But we're not in allegiance. We're not thinking the body's going to save me. That's the radical shift. Because right now, having a comfortable body from my ordinary, ignorant frame of mind, having a comfortable bodily experience seems like it's really going to save me. And then that just sets up the betrayal when that goes away and I'm sick or I'm feeling pain in the body. And we're always feeling betrayed by those times when the body feels good because it won't last. But we need to leave it here. And uh, feel free like uh, Tom and Barbara did. They sent a question in and then I, it, it often really helps me um, put the talks together. So feel free to send a question. You all have my email address and you can do that. And next week we'll have small groups and these, uh, some of these issues around what you're learning with pain. It'd be really great to share that in the small groups, including the frustrations that might be coming up for you. So wishing everybody a good week of practice and I look forward to connecting next Monday night.